Navy Fellow here at the Center for New American Security. And I'm Javier Gonzalez, this year's Navy Fellow at Johns Hopkins University at Applied Physics Lab. So we're here today to talk to you about some research we've done this year into what we think may be one of the gravest but perhaps less talked about threats to U.S. Pow military power in the, West, in the uh, Asia Pacific. And that is the growing capability of China's People's Liberation Army Rocket Force to threaten U.S. bases in Asia. We believe that U.S. policymakers and leaders should understand that in the event of a crisis that potentially threatens China's core strategic interests or perhaps the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party, that a preemptive strike against the bases that underpin U.S. military power in the Western Pacific could be a real possibility. Such a preemptive strike would be consistent with China's military force doctrine as well as China's overall military strategy. An imagery that we're going to show you indicates, shows real world imagery of them potentially practicing these strikes at an impact range in Western China. But does China have the forces necessary to pull off such a military strike? We did open source modeling and simulation, which results in what we think to be areas of great concern that call for action now. So at its beginning, the Chinese ballistic missile force was uh, focused primarily on nuclear deterrence. But after observing the tremendous success of uh, U.S. forces during the first Gulf War, the force transformed into one with both conventional and nuclear capabilities. Using what has been described as a projectile-centric strategy, China was able to minimize some of the disadvantages associated with platform capabilities and took advantage of, of uh, it took advantage of uh, platform capabilities and factors such as local geography um, and greater bank for the bulk against ships and aircraft and gaps in international uh, law because China does not participate in the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. The Chinese Missile Force now consists of about 100,000 personnel and I was recently elevated to a status co-equal to that of China's other military services. As described in open source documents, Chinese missile doctrine calls for a range of deterrence, compellents, and coercive operations. In the event of deterrence fails, a missile campaign would target locations such as command centers, communications hubs, air and missile defenses, air and naval bases, fuel depots, electrical power facilities, and aircraft carrier strike groups. The ballistic missile strikes will be followed by slower cruise missiles and aircraft, which will be destroying targets such as aircraft that are, uh, that are in place due to uh, runway cratering. Notably, Chinese tests of missile uh, campaign centers on the importance of surprise and indicate a preference for preemptive strikes. And utilizing missile strikes to indicate the shortcomings may be still valid to uh, China's overall military strategy of active defense in that China may believe that a preemptive kinetic strike is a defensive counterattack to a rival's mere threatening of his, of his uh, sovereignty or core interest, even if only in the strategic realm. So if you're having trouble imagining what a preemptive strike like this from the Chinese PLA rocket force might look like, worry no more. Chinese state-owned television has produced a program describing an island, what they call an island uh, rec reclamation campaign, which involves US counterintervention. And you'll see what these strikes look like. This is as visualized by them.
It appears that in the real world, the PLA rocket force appears to be making quite real the capabilities that you saw in that video and that, as we mentioned before, in their doctrine. Specifically, at a ballistic missile impact range located in western China on the edge of the Gobi Desert, we see exactly the sort of targets talked about in PLA rocket force doctrine and also shown in that video. Targets such as groups of vehicles, perhaps representing mobile air and missile defense batteries, kind of like you saw in the video. Parked aircraft targets out in the open, as you saw the submunitions uh, deployed that struck those targets. Fuel depots, as discussed in their doctrine and as shown in the video. Runway cratering via submunitions, again, as you saw in the video and as discussed in their doctrine. Electrical facilities, this is a mock electrical substation that doesn't appear to have any power lines going to or from it. And the accurate delivery of penetrating warheads to hardened aircraft shelters and targets. As well as to multi-story command centers. Of note, the ability to strike command centers such as these with penetrating warheads in the first few minutes of a conflict could give the, the Chinese the ability to destroy those command centers with their command staffs in them in the first few crucial minutes of the conflict. Now, in 2010, Dr. Toshio Shihara, who's with us here today, wrote that authoritative PLA publications indicated discussions by the Chinese of their intentions to attempt to preemptively strike U.S. ships in port at the start of a conflict. Attention was focused most especially on the U.S. naval base in Yokosuka, right outside of Tokyo, home to the U.S. 7th Fleet, the U.S. 7th Fleet command ship, and the United States sole four deployed nuclear aircraft carrier. Evidence that China had been practicing to strike ships like these in port would lend credence to Dr. Yoshihara's concerns, and such evidence exists. Again, out, at the, out in the Gobi Desert, we see ship-shaped targets that appear to be almost exactly the same size as U.S. Arleigh Burke-class destroyers. Of note, these targets are positioned within a mock harbor, the outline of which is an almost identical match mirror image for the actual inner harbor of the U.S. naval base in Yokosuka. It bears considering that the only way that China could, could expect to catch multiple ships in port would be through a surprise attack. Otherwise, in the case of a brewing crisis, the United States likely would have sent its fleet to sea. Now, while skeptics might say that it's unlikely that we, they would, the United States would be able to be caught flat-footed like that, history tells us not to, dis, to discount, not to discount the possibility of successful surprise attacks. We'd also point out that there are plenty of reports of the PLA rocket force extensively practicing denial and deception techniques. So, China missile forces appears to have developed the capability to precisely target U.S. fixed bases. They also seem to have been practicing doing so preemptively. But does China have the capacity to conduct an effective and wide-ranging missile strike against U.S. bases? We try to answer that question, and we use a few basic steps to accomplish that. First, we look at the categories described on, uh, mentioned on the PLA Rocket Force Doctrine, and then through an open source red team analysis that included commercially available imagery, social media, base maps and directories, press releases, etc., we were able to compile a list of possible targets. In the end, we came up with approximately 500 targets. And this is a good example of uh, the uh, potential targets we identified at the Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. So as the next step of our analysis, we wanted to determine whether China actually has the inventory to be able to conduct a wide-ranging preemptive strike as we've discussed. And to do that, we being professional ship drivers, decided to, to build upon the work of previous professional defense analysts, in particular, RAND Corporation's 2015 U.S. Military China Scorecard Report. We used very uh, similar uh, assumptions that they did and uh, tried to use similar methods of analysis to determine those numbers. The results that we found were that the required number of missiles that we estimated they would require to conduct such a strike would likely be well within the bounds of most analysts' estimates of the PLA rocket force inventory for those targets. 
You can see here the ranges that uh, are estimated for that. These most recent and updated ranges are from the, the recently released 2017 DOD China Military Power Report, which you can see here are about 1,200 short-range ballistic missiles that can reach Kadita Air Base, Sasebo Naval Base, and Misawa Air Base, including the DF-11, 15, and 16. And then two to 300 conventional medium-range ballistic missiles or anti-ship ballistic missiles that can cover all the Japanese home islands, and two to 300 ground-launched cruise missiles. We'd point out that based on a recent simultaneous test launch that the PLA Rocket Force conducted, where they launched 10 DF-21C medium-range ballistic missiles, perhaps as a, as a demonstration, this was right after the most recent presidential election, we believe that the, most estimates are probably, we think it's probably on the high end. Otherwise, we have a hard time imagining them shooting off a large percentage of their inventory just in one test shot. Of course, the PLA Rocket Force not, is not shy about displaying its capabilities. And in fact, here is a video courtesy of the PLA Rocket Force and China Television of that test shot. happened to freeze frame one time and you can see a human head of a mannequin uh, popping through there. Yeah. Anyways, um, so where was I? Uh, one thing we'd point out here was that, is that the, uh, as far as we can tell through our open source research, the largest number of uh, ballistic missiles that have ever been intercepted in a uh, U.S. ballistic missile defense test is two. So to assess the likely effectiveness of uh, a missile strike against U.S. and allied missile defenses, we try to determine through two different methods. Um, how many missiles might make it to the targets and what their effects could be. First, we use a spreadsheet method, very similar to how others have looked at the problem in the past, to estimate how many missiles might be intercepted by our defenses and how many missiles might leak through. The assumptions that we make for this analysis can be found in our detailed report. So the next, next way that we analyzed how, how a potential Chinese missile strike might fare is using commercially available wargaming simulations. In this case, one called Command Modern Air Naval Operations, or CMONO for short. This commercially available simulation is used by uh, other military defense analysts as well as defense contractors. Using the built-in scenario editor and uh, weapon system database, we put Patriot batteries at all the locations where we could ascertain their existence in open source uh, discussions, as well as a terminal high altitude area defense, or THAAD battery, in the location where it's uh, apparently in Okinawa, I'm sorry, in uh, South Korea. You can see here the Chinese missiles on their way to their targets. These are short range ballistic missiles, DF-15Bs, similar to the ones you saw in the, uh, in the video, the white one that was, that was launched. There are long, somewhat longer range DF-16s here and here that are headed towards Sasebo Air Base, or Sasebo Naval Base, and Masawa Air Base in northern Japan, as well as longer range DF-21Cs headed towards targets in, in uh, the Tokyo area, such as Yokosuka and Yokota Air Base. This simulation is running in real time. The clock, the time of launch was at 12 o'clock even. I think you can barely make that out. Uh, we brought this on screen at about the two minute point. We think that's about where command center personnel would be alerted of the incoming strike based on a couple of minutes for space-based sen space sensors to pick it up and to determine the trajectory of the inbound weapons. We ran and recorded the simulation multiple times, recording uh, numbers such as the numbers of defensive weapons expended, sir, uh, ballistic missile defenses, numbers of aircraft destroyed on the ground, runways cratered, strip ships struck in port pier side, and command center struck. Some key takeaways that we had are that the Patriot batteries that defend, and there's multiple Patriot batteries as far as we can tell, that defend Okinawa are likely to be overwhelmed by the sheer number of short-range ballistic missiles available in China's inventory. Additionally, we found that the overall ballistic missile defense architecture of Japan seems mainly oriented towards stopping smaller numbers of North Korean ballistic missiles. And while we think this is a worthy goal, certainly, 
and perhaps a more immediate threat. We think that it seems to us that the BMD laydown in Japan, around our bases is most likely inadequate to stop the uh, mass raid from the PLA rocket force. We'd also point out that flight times to bases in Japan for these ballistic missiles were on the order of six to nine minutes, which is a bit shorter than we thought they would be. In order to validate that, that seems short to us, we simulated a known test launch. We simulated a, a, a Minuteman III ICBM launch, which went from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California to a target in Kwajalein Atoll in the Pacific, published as having taken 27 minutes. We ran it in the simulation, it took 25 and a half minutes. So a less than 10% difference. Now these simulations, which model damage to specific facilities and their hosted units, gave us some overall takeaways, which are discussed in more detail in our report. First, in most cases, we saw cratering of every runway and every runway length taxiway at every major US air base in Japan. Additionally, we saw almost every major fixed headquarters and logistical facility destroyed by either the initial, initial ballistic missile strike or follow-on cruise missile strikes, with especially the key command centers destroyed in the first few minutes by ballistic missiles. In most cases, we saw almost every US ship in port in Japan struck pierside by ballistic missiles. And finally, due to runway cratering, degradation of missile defenses, and destruction of headquarters, over 200 US aircraft destroyed on the ground in the first, in the first few hours of the conflict. Now, while efforts are underway, to, to improve defensive areas such as base hardening, force dispersal, and effects on, on uh, Chinese targeting, excuse me, as well as advanced research into uh, ballistic missile defenses such as high velocity projectiles, rail guns, and lasers, you know, we see that there's more immediate action required now. You can see here as an example, these are DF-21Cs about to strike Iwakuni Air Base on the island of Kyushu. Uh, it was able to overfly these Patriot batteries because they're not equipped to shoot high enough to shoot down uh, medium-range missiles that are outside of the atmosphere. So we saw through both of our methods of simulation, both using this simulation and spreadsheets, that significant or sim similar numbers of ballistic missiles were likely to make it to their targets. Here you can see five Patriot batteries defending Okinawa, trying to stop 170 inbound short-range ballistic missiles. Ultimately, what you'll see is white puffs as those ballistic missiles reach their targets. They'd be causing effects on the ground, I guess similar to what we saw in the Chinese video, both of them. So to see if a later missile defense might help against a missile strike by the Chinese, we rewrite our models and simulations with some fundamental changes. First, we added two ballistic missile defense ships, one in the Sea of Japan, the other one in the East China Sea. We added five TAD batteries in uh, Japan. We dedicated two pitcher batteries to protect Iwakuni and Sasebo. And we proposed some doctrinal changes, especially for a scenario like we just discussed, a mass race scenario, um, versus something more traditional of less ballistic missiles um, like in the North Korean scenario. Some of our findings, specifically in Okinawa, um, we still found that the Okinawa defenses will still be overwhelmed by the sheer number of ballistic missiles incoming to Okinawa, but at least the damage was mitigated. More importantly, what we found was that most of the ballistic missiles heading to the main Japan, to the mainland in Japan, were mostly intercepted. This allowed to provide enough time to accomplish a couple of things. One, it provided time for the aircraft to be able to take off and mount the, some sort of defense against the common cruise missiles. It also allowed for critical facilities to be evacuated and provided time for the ships in port to bring the air missile defenses and get away from the pure positions. Some other specific recommendations we make for uh, policymakers and leaders are also detailed in our report, which is available outside. Now, while some may have argued that ballistic missile defense is a hopeless proposition with interceptors that cost more than the missiles that they are attempting to stop, our modeling and simulation and tallies indicate that perhaps the only thing more expensive than ballistic missile defense may be not having it against a threat of this, of this size. In this case, based on our revised simulations, what seems like a few billion dollars, admittedly a large amount, a ballistic missile defense architecture, and we pointed this, we would point out at this point that since we started this project, Japan is now apparently considering buying THAAD batteries of their own. That kind of investment could save what we tallied up as tens of billions of dollars of ships 
aircraft, facilities destroyed on the ground at the pier, as well as the lives of numerous service personnel in those facilities. Most importantly, robust missile defense like this could potentially allow for firmer U.S. action in the case of a crisis, and so doubt into the minds of Chinese leaders that a strike like this would succeed against our defenses. I doubt they have, they have that doubt right now. And thereby, thereby avoid, in the first place, a shooting war through that temptation. Thank you for your time and attention. The opinions we've expressed in analysis today are, of course, those of our, our, own, our us alone, and do not represent those of the United States Navy, the DOD, or the US government. Uh, we're now gonna take a short break. Oh, no, we're down to four minutes left, sorry. We're gonna move straight on to our next panel, 11 o'clock. Um, we have a great panel coming up on Iran with uh, Senators Chris Murphy and Kelly Ayotte. We don't wanna be late for that, along with some other heavy hitters will be on the room, room too. Thank you. Thank you.